King's Road arches. Police, firefighters and paramedics joined forces with lifeboat crews and coast guards to try to save him. The search hampered by heavy rain, severe cold and high swells in the sea. Just over two hours later, the man was found and brought ashore. But desperate attempts to revive him failed and he was pronounced dead at the Royal Sussex County Hospital shortly after. A woman who was with the man did try to save him. She managed to get out of the water and raise the alarm. She was checked over by paramedics and escaped unhurt. It's not yet clear why the man entered the sea, but today other beachgoers were warned not to put their own lives at risk by straying too close to the water. Always risky, but especially dangerous in the cold and the dark. There is going to be a, a time delay in raising the alarm with any sort of friends or, or, or bystanders uh, who can assist, uh, but it will happen quickly. You know, the cold water shock will happen extremely quick. Your body temperature will go down. Uh, your coordination will go down, you will find it a struggle to swim uh, and from there it's going to be very difficult to get back out of the water. The man who lost his life here has still to be named, but police say they're not treating his death as suspicious. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News, Brighton. A driver has been sent to a young offenders institution after he ploughed into a cyclist in Bournemouth and left him for dead. Well, Mary Stanley is in our newsroom for us. And Mary, police have released CCTV of the moment the cyclist was struck. Yes, the video shows the car driven by 19-year-old Benjamin George hit the cyclist as he sped through a red light in Westbourne in October last year. We've decided not to show the moment of impact but the cyclist, a 34-year-old man, flies several feet through the air and is seen unconscious on the pavement. The cyclist survived and is continuing to recover at home. The car, a gold-covered Vauxhall Tigra driven by Benjamin George, was first reported to police earlier that night, driving erratically along Richmond Park Road in Charminster and later on Holdenhurst Road. He then drove the wrong way down the Wessex Way dual carriageway that's when police stopped their pursuit because it was too dangerous. It was later on in Pool Road in Westbourne that George drove through a red light, hitting the cyclist and speeding away. The 19-year-old from Bournemouth pleaded guilty to causing injury by dangerous driving, failing to stop for police, as well as several other motoring offences. He's been sentenced to five years. He's also been banned for driving for six years. Mary, thank you. Two women remain in police custody tonight after a 36-year-old woman died in a house in Portsmouth on Saturday night. Police were called to Toronto Road in Buckland following reports a woman had been injured. She later died at the scene. A 43-year-old woman has been arrested on suspicion of murder and a 52-year-old woman has been arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender. Police have been granted more time to question them. There are fears tonight that vulnerable young people in a Hampshire town could be at risk if a drop-in centre is closed. The junction in Andover is a lifeline for many people who say they have nowhere else to go. The number of suicides in the town is high. Around one person dies every month. Managers of the junction say the centre will be forced to close next month after the county council cut their funding by £56,000. Well, in just a moment, we shall give you some helpline information. But first, here's Rachel Hepworth. A music session at the junction, building skills, friendships, and for guitarist Davey, a new confidence. I had a few mental health issues and um, I unfortunately gave in to some of the thoughts I was having and ended up passing out in front of the junction. I wish I was special. His is a familiar story here. He was picked up and helped out. And like hundreds of others who use the junction, can't understand why it's facing closure. If a builder is building a house and he gets halfway, it doesn't take the bricks from the bottom to build the top. And that's what's happening here. They're trying to take away the foundations of our community. And considering the amount of young people who commit suicide in this town, I find it absolutely appalling that our community centre is hanging by a thread. 
To the outside world, Andover may seem like a relatively affluent market town, immune from the problems of the inner cities, but it's not without its troubles or its tragedies. There are pockets of poverty here, unemployment and particularly homelessness, all drivers for mental illness and suicide. You know, it's such a horrible subject to, to speak about, but I think it, um, there's such a taboo about it as well, it needs to be spoken about. Yasmin was homeless and desperate when she first came to the junction. They helped her find somewhere to live and gave her a job. She, like many others, believed the emotional support offered through counselling and practical help with housing has saved dozens more from drugs, prison and despair. It's pre preventive what they do. You don't always see, you know, the works, but they are brilliant people and they're very kind people. Clearly, um, the mental health in young people in Andover is, is quite dire, and I worry about that. For one homeless person, you know, that's going to cost the county thousands and thousands. We, would, we do save a fortune, and I think it's a false economy to close this and say they can go elsewhere for their support. Whatever makes you happy. The way they've helped me you know, don't, OK, I've not got loads of money or anything, but when I'm with these people and the way they've helped me, what I've got now, I feel rich. A message they hope can be translated into real money to prevent more youngsters feeling alienated. Well, Rachel joins us now. Rachel, a very difficult subject to deal with. Will the council have a rethink, do you think? Well, at the moment, they say not, mainly because they say they have so many competing priorities on their already overstretched budget. They have given us a statement saying that funding uh, was turned down because the services offered would have replicated or duplicated uh, those uh, being provided by the new clinical commissioning group contract and saying they can't fund projects for children during school hours. Uh, that may, of course, all be true, but I do think that um, many of those fighting for the junction would say they need to look at the bigger picture. Um, that a lot of work done at the junction prevents greater damage and expense down the line and the expertise and trust that's been built up there will also be lost. Uh, they've launched a petition and I should say that many people have been working very hard behind the scenes to come up with a solution, uh, among them the Ham Hampshire County Councillor for Andover North. If one person falls by the wayside because of this closure, that would cost more than the £56,000 that County Council is seeking to save over this and I would therefore urge Roy Perry, Councillor Perry, our the council leader, to come down to Andover to see for himself what service this centre provides at the junction. Well, of course, we'll be watching this one very closely and let you know if there are any developments. Uh, there is more on our website, including a list of support services. Just go to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Rachel, thank you. A group of MPs from Sussex have been meeting the Transport Secretary, Chris Grayling, today to try to get his support for a second mainline railway linking Brighton and London. They say a consortium made up of developers and investors has come up with plans which would give more towns in Sussex a direct link to the capital and ease pressure on the current mainline. We've got serious investors now who are willing to fund this project and deliver this project uh, for the government if the government has an appetite to make it happen. And, and so I think for the first time ever, we've got a realistic plan on the table. You are watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Thanks for choosing us. Coming up. Tributes to star racehorse Many Clowns, the grand national hero who sadly died at the weekend. For more on all of our stories, do head to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Any views or news, why not give us a call? 0808 1010 095 is the number to ring or get in touch via Facebook or why not send us a tweet at ITV Meridian. It's almost February and most schools will be having a break mid-month for half term. The question for parents though is are you or have you taken your child out of school for a holiday? Well tomorrow the Supreme Court will assess whether parents whose children go to school regularly should be allowed to take them on holiday in term time. Follows the case of Isle of Whitefather John Platt who refused to pay a fine for taking his daughter 
to Florida. Well, in the last year, many councils have relaxed their fines policy as they wait for the final court decision. But in 2014-2015, figures show us that West Sussex issued more than 3,000 fines for unauthorised absence, Portsmouth more than 1,000. The Isle of Wight issued 1,800 fines compared to 248 in Hampshire. Oxfordshire issued just 66 fines, Bracknell Forest almost 700. In 2015-2016, however, Surrey continued to fine parents, 1,717 in all, totalling more than £100,000. Well, in just a moment, Matt Price investigates the difference in the cost of holidays. But first, Emma Wilkinson reminds us of the story so far. Term time holidays, right or wrong, penalty fines, fair or unfair. John Platt has found himself right at the centre of that debate. When his family took time out for a holiday, he could never have imagined that tomorrow, 21 months on, he'd be in the highest court in the land over it. It all started with a trip to Florida. Two of our children were off school. It was half term for them. One wasn't. We sought the permission of the school to take her with us. They refused it. We took her anyway. Came back, got a penalty notice, refused to pay it, explained why and was taken to magistrate's court when I refused to pay the penalty notice. But magistrates ruled he had no case to answer because his daughter attended school regularly during the rest of the year. Isle of Wight Council took the case to the High Court, which backed the magistrates, saying they were entitled to take into account the wider picture of the child's attendance record. The council then went to the Supreme Court for permission to launch a final legal challenge, which was granted. The Department for Education says evidence shows that every extra day missed can affect a child's education and parents shouldn't take them out of school without good reason. At this age I think they learn so much more by going away with, with their families, going to different places, seeing different places. You're a parent, you make the right decision for your choice for your family and for your child. I went away just before Christmas and they fined me, but otherwise I'd have had to pay £2,000 more. So I'd rather take the £60 fine to be honest with you. John says he's been contacted by hundreds of families with questions about this issue. He hopes tomorrow's judgment will provide some clarity. No case has ever gone past the High Court on this issue, Section 444 of the Education Act. I'm hoping the Supreme Court go further than just saying that the High Court did not make a mistake. I'm hoping they actually go as far as to say, we think that regular attendance is often and actually put a number on it because it'll give everybody a degree of certainty going forward. Courts, schools and families across the country will be watching to see what the consequences of this case could be. Emma Wilkinson, ITV News. Well, of course, there's always that price hike facing parents who take their children on holiday for half term, with research showing some package holidays can actually treble in price. Figures released to ITV Meridian show how a flight to the Canaries can go up by more than £360 during the February break. That's why this October, schools in Brighton Hove will have a new two-week half term and a shorter summer holiday to help parents with the cost. Here's Matt Price. For parents heading abroad during school holidays, they've come to expect sun, sea and soaring prices. Martin Carrington's already booked his break abroad and is taking 15-year-old Leon out of school to save hundreds of pounds on the price. I think it's ridiculous. You stop it in the same accommodation, you stop it in the same hotel, you're using the same plane as everybody else. Why should they put it up by an extra 110, at some times of the year, £200 a week? We met up with Martin on the Costa Blanca last summer. He went to Benidorm just before the schools broke up and by doing so made a big saving. And now a new study shows by just how much those prices can differ. The currency provider FairFX compared 120 flight routes across the UK and say prices went up threefold on average during the half-term period. In one of their examples, a flight to Venice cost £406 in the school holidays, down to just £43 two weeks later. And ITV News has found an all-inclusive family break to the Canaries, increasing by £1,700. We've exhaustively checked this. It's not the first time we've checked it and it always comes out the same way. Ian Stratford-Taylor is the firm's chief executive. They will say the operators it's about supply and demand and I have some sympathy for that argument but the scale of rises we see, you can't justify that. 
But tonight, the body which represents travel agents has questioned the study. Abta says it was conducted very shortly before the travel departure dates and that families normally book well in advance, but they admit prices can spike. One solution we have suggested is that school holidays be staggered. Um, that happens across um, the continent and that helps alleviate the sharp peaks in demand and pricing that we do see. At this travel agent, there's no sign of a downturn in trade. Eric Walton's been in the business for 40 years and says nothing will put Brits off wanting to travel. The British travelling population are quite a resilient bunch of people they are. And, and despite what, uh, what's been thrown in front of them over the, the past few years, they still want to travel, believe you me, they do, yeah. Some careful budgeting means Martin can afford to travel this year. But while we all want a great deal, for some it is still too expensive. Left with little choice then but to hope for some winter sun here at home. Matt Price, ITV News. And it's always a good talking point and many of you have been expressing your views on this subject on our Facebook page. Indeed you have. Jill Purchase from Wokingham says it's not always possible for parents to take their children out of school during the term. It's not always about the cost of holidays. Sarah Pimbley says, I think if a child has attendance of 90% or more, they should be allowed to have a week off in term time. Having a family vacation does not mean it's not educational. Meanwhile, Cheryl Lee says, we were taken out every year without fail. I worked hard and got good grades and it didn't impact on my education. Thank you, as always, for all of your points of view. The ITV Evening News continues with the national and international news at 6.30. Here's Mary Nightingale. Theresa May says she is very happy to invite Donald Trump to the UK despite the row over his immigration crackdown. More than a million people have signed a petition calling for the president's state visit to Britain to be cancelled. Mr Trump is facing protests in the US and abroad after banning visitors from seven Muslim-majority countries. And after FA Cup success for Sutton and Lincoln, who will the non-league giant killers face next? Do join me for those stories and more. 6.30. In other news, police are searching a river near to Magdalen Bridge in Oxford following reports a cyclist fell in. Police, ambulance and fire crews are at the scene and are still working to find the man. Officers were called at 20 to 3 this afternoon. An attempt by campaigners to bring a High Court challenge against the third runway at Heathrow Airport has failed. A coalition of local councils, including Windsor and Maidenhead, together with Greenpeace, claim the government's decision to back plans for the runway is unlawful and fails to recognise the impact on air quality. But a High Court ruling has decided that any judicial review cannot be heard until after the government formally decides to expand Heathrow. You won't escape detection. That is the message from the DVLA to drivers of untaxed vehicles here in the South. Extra teams of wheel clampers are roaming the UK's roads as part of a New Year crackdown. In Portsmouth, more than 1,000 cars were clamped for not being licensed. Almost 4,000 cars were clamped in Sussex. Now, while a car can be taxed over the internet, the telephone or indeed at the post office, the agency estimates last year almost 600,000 vehicles were not licensed. Our reporter Johnny Blair joined one of their detection vans. With the rattle of a chain and the click of a padlock, another untaxed vehicle is off the road. These high-tech vans are patrolling more often than usual, equipped with camera after camera after camera. Using a number plate recognition system, every car is scanned. Basically, we drive along with the postcode earlier, so it's not targeted, as in we're not told where vehicles are. Taxed ones make this noise. Untaxed ones sound like this. Attention, attention. Anecdotally, what are the reasons people give you for not taxing their cars? 
I think the main reason is that they've forgotten to tax it or that they've just bought the vehicle. You obviously have the, um, the determined offender for whatever reason. They don't want to become compliant. But also, I mean, the technology has moved on in, in recent years and uh, it's much easier to detect these vehicles now. When a car is clamped, the owner has 24 hours to pay a release fine, a minimum of £260. If unpaid, the vehicle is seized and taken to the nearest compound. That means an additional £100 release fee and £21 for each day it stays. There are 21 of these compounds across the UK and many cars here are never claimed. We have three ways in which they're disposed of. I mean, if they are um, a reasonable vehicle capable of going back on the road, then they're auctioned. Uh, you then have the sort of middle type of vehicle where it's worth dismantling and um, the parts can, can be sold. And then we have the, the cars that really aren't going anywhere and shouldn't be, and those are, those are crushed. Most people pay to have the clamp removed within a day, followed, of course, by their road tax. The message, though, is clear. It's never been easier to tax your vehicle or harder to escape detection. Johnny Blair, ITV News. On a taxing weekend for Oxford United, was it, Andrew Pate? No, what a match. Yes, the magic of the FA Cup is still alive for just one of our clubs. Oxford United sprang a surprise, knocking out Geordie Giants, Newcastle, and they'll find out in an hour's time who they'll be playing in the fifth round. For other teams, big changes to their lineups led to embarrassing cup defeats. Last break of the game. Bully score. Oh, yes! Oh, what a finish! Selco, sponsoring ITV Meridian Sports Report. This is the first time Oxford United have made it through to the fifth round for 23 years. Kane Hemmings poking home to set them on their way. Goalkeeper Simon Eastwood was man of the match, saving Alexander Mitrovic's spot kick. And Oxford didn't look back, Curtis Nelson powering in a header to double the score. West Ham Loney Tony Martinez wrapped up the win on his debut. Oxford hoping to make the quarter-finals for the first time since 1964. Brighton's promotion push led to them making nine changes and they crashed out at non-league Lincoln City, despite taking the lead with this fantastic finish from Richie Tao. But it all went wrong in the 57th minute, Glenn Murray giving away a penalty and keeper Nicky Mayampa injuring his shoulder. 37-year-old substitute Kasper Ankergren coming on to be beaten. Then, on loan Chelsea defender Fikayo Tomori scored a most unfortunate own goal on his debut. Seagulls boss Chris Hewton angry that all the goals came from mistakes, Lincoln becoming just the eighth non-league side to make it through to the fifth round of the FA Cup. Both Southampton and Arsenal made 10 changes, but it was Saints who were undone. Former Saints striker Alan Shearer says Premier League clubs are cheating fans by making so many changes. Fit again Theo Walcott not complaining, the ex-Saints star scoring a hat-trick. Reading made sure they capitalise on Brighton and Newcastle being in cup action. The Royals winning to cut the gap on the top two. And it's Yapstam's men who kick off our Football League Roundup. Stam says the team's momentum should keep them above the chasing pack. Gareth McCleary's clever back heel setting up John Swift. John Rules levelled from the spot for Cardiff, but Jan Kermigan grabbed all three points with this free kick. Reading today announcing the signing of Romanian striker Adrian Popper from Star Bucharest. Swindon's struggles continue. 
Billy Bowden with a fine strike, which leaves Town just one place above the relegation zone. Portsmouth missed out on a possible spot in the League Two automatic promotion places. Inform Exeter grabbing their fifth win in a row with David Wheeler's strike. Crawley thought they'd grabbed a much deserved point at Notts County with this fantastic finish by Jamie Collins with just four minutes to go. But Kevin Nolan's county struck in the 90th minute through Jonathan Ford. Finally, from me, sad news at the weekend with Lambourne trained horse Many Clouds passing away moments after winning a thrilling Cotswold chase at Cheltenham. The 8 to 1 shot in the green and yellow here overtook favourite Thistlecrack on the home straight in what was his first race of the year. Trainer Oliver Sherwood called Many Clouds a horse of a lifetime, and jockey Leighton Aspel said the 10 year old was a jockey's dream. Aspel saddled many clouds in all of his 27 races, famously winning both the Grand National and Gold Cup in 2015. Leighton Aspel saying it was a privilege to have been part of such a wonderful partnership. Really such sad. a very, very sad story. Andrew, thank, thank you very you. much indeed. OK, time now for a look at your weather. Simon Parkin. From blizzards to pool, driving through Europe, Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Well, as Mondays go, this one has been a bit damp and gloomy. Certainly it was a grey and murky start in Swanage when Richard was out taking this picture of the old pier first thing. And it wasn't much better further down the coast in Southampton later in the morning when Malachy took this picture of a very misty looking Southampton. As we head through the next few days, nothing really changes. There's more cloud and there's more bits of dampness to come too. Basically low pressure taking charge, forcing weather systems our way from the west. And that means you'll get a bit of rain then you'll get a dry spell, then another bit of rain, then another dry spell, all the while staying mostly cloudy. And by the end of the week, you'll notice that the isobars are starting to squeeze and the winds will pick up as well. For this evening, nothing especially strong wind-wise, but a band of rain working its way north and eastwards through the first part of the night. Mostly light and patchy, that rain, nothing too sinister in there. Then a drier spell before more rain turns up as we head towards tomorrow morning. But thanks to the cloud cover, at least it's not a cold night. Temperatures should be frost free with lows of five or six degrees. So a bit of dampness first thing tomorrow morning. Tricky rush hour, but that'll clear away fairly quickly. And then we get a dry spell. More rain though pushing up from the south and west and some of that later in the day could turn heavy and more persistent. But look at those temperatures. Last week, if you remember, fours and fives was our daily peak. Tomorrow we're looking at highs of around 10 or 11. That's 52 in Fahrenheit, which is pretty good going for the end of January. As for your high tide times in Southampton, quarter to one in the morning, then one in the afternoon and then Wednesday, another messy day of weather. It will probably start off with rain at first, but then it will turn drier later on. Euro Tunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. In just a moment, we've got the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. So Gita's got our late news. Join her if you can. But for now, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you so much for watching. Take care. See you bye later. Bye-bye.